What is the function of the Documentation Center of Austrian Resistance in Austrian society? Um, I think that we have to start at the beginning with this. It was founded in 63, 65, so there is a little um, period uh, when uh, um, former survivors of Nazi persecution and people who were active in the resistance felt that uh, again old former Nazis were becoming more active. So after 55, the state treaty, the situation changes a lot. And then by the middle of the 60s, when uh, this is uh, the documentation archive is founded, uh, this is really what the, what the reason was. They had this feeling that now the old forces, the old fascist forces are becoming very present in Austria soci Austrian society again and that they had to document what had happened before and also the persecution and the resistance. And uh, this they did and uh, it started off as an association and uh, became uh, a foundation in the early 80s. Now, what it became, there's two things that it became famous for. The first one was uh, also starting, already starting in the 70s, that they started to publish a series of uh, publications which were called Widerstand und Verfolgung, Resistance and Persecution, and as they had planned to do one for every province of Austria. They got the first uh, volumes out, so one of the, not the very first, but one of the first was actually about the, the province where I come from, Burgenland, and th this was a, a completely mesmerizing effect. Yeah? I remember, so I was uh, just starting at the university when it came out, and uh, for my generation, this whole feeling about uh, the Nazi period uh, was very ambivalent. Yeah? So, first of all, you had this impression, okay, you learn in school, although very little, but this is something very bad. Yeah? Uh, you, when you listen to the conversations uh, in your family, etc., what you hear is a sort of, well, you know, it was, not everything was bad, etc. So this is something we didn't really know about. Yeah? And we had no idea what was happening. What we saw from the, you know, books, there were a couple of films, was something very, very horrible stories, persecution of Jews, killing of Jews, yeah? uh, but it all happened very far away. Yeah? So it happened in, in places nobody had ever been, you know, Auschwitz, who the hell knows where Auschwitz is, and by people that nobody knew, you know, sort of half monsters. Yeah? And then out comes this volume on your province and you open it and then you read what? In our town here, you know, 10 people persecuted, some executed, there was resistance here, uh, so many people, yeah? uh, the Jews driven out, uh, so many Roma being killed, quite a lot in Burgenland actually. And uh, for us this was a revelation. Yeah? So these publications became very, very important, till today we don't have publications for every province. Yeah? One province in the very west for Adelberg, which did its own uh, kind of research. Uh, and they have published something which I think is very much okay. So this, this was the first role to provide this kind of information, which for at least my generation and the next generations of the 80s and 90s was very important. And the second one, of course, was that they were, uh, the uh, documentation archive is documenting right-wing and neo-Nazi uh, activities in Austria. And uh, as you uh, probably all know, so a lot of this was focused also on the rise of the so-called FPÖ, the Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs and centered also very strongly for some time around the figure of uh, Jörg Haider. And for this, uh, the Dokumentationsarchiv is really famous. So basically, um, we are, I think, this year 
we've been in the media, in the Austrian media, about two times a week, yeah? in one of the papers. Uh, if we count the foreign papers, it's more, so it's maybe once a day. Yeah? It's, it's quite a lot, so we are being r really, really sought after here, and there is a special expertise that we have. So basically you can say the Documentation Archive has been documenting right-wing uh, activities, publications, etc., like nobody else. So, for example, on Monday, <coughs> representatives of this uh, historical commission of the Freiheitliche Partei will come to us. The, ar the archive is public. Anybody can come. Yeah? Uh, and they will look up what we have on their own party. And I'm sure we have a lot more about their own party than they have in their own archive. Yeah? So, this, this, this function is, of course, very important for the media, for journalists, yeah? and uh, that is usually what happens. So if uh, a representative who is more or less known or where people sort of uh, have, have an impression that he is closer to, to right-wing politics, uh, journalists will come and will look through our files, uh, whether be there were some publications, maybe this, this person has, has been active, you know, giving speeches, writing articles in right-wing publications, and this you can find in, in our institution. So for, for this, actually, we are more famous than for the historical research that we are doing. And the historical research, this is also maybe unique, is that uh, um, because there is such an institution in a small country that has started to collect uh, all kinds of documents about the central topic of the 20th century, so call it the Nazi period, but also initially there, the collection started in 1934, so with the begin uh, of Austro-Fascism, Austro yeah? and uh, now today th this is actually the really contested part of Austrian politics. Yeah? But initially, the research period was 34 to 45, not 38 to 45, 34 to 45. And uh, also, material that for the period that leads up to it, so the 20s and 30s, and also what happened or did not happen after 45 in Austrian society. Yeah? And now we, you have this huge collection all in one point. So the, the fine thing is you come here, uh, you look into our databases, and then you get the material in 20 minutes. Not everything, but more or less the most important thing we do have, either in the original or in the copy. Yeah? And uh, this is why our uh, archive is actually used very much. So if you are look at the number of users, we are among the 10 largest uh, public archives uh, in, in Austria, actually. And this kind of expertise and material has enabled us to put together so-called databases of victims. So the Documentation Archive has produced over the decades and f with public money, yeah? uh, this database of Holocaust victims, for example, yeah? of all ho Austrian Holocaust victims and of the, say, about 65,000, at least over 64,000 are clearly documented yeah, uh, through documents. Yeah? It's not like in Yad Vashem where a relative says, oh, we had an uncle somewhere and his name was, I don't know, Yoshko, yeah, something. And then, um, you know, this, this can be right, can be wrong, the spelling can be right, the spelling can, no. There is clear document evidence that this person with this name, with a birth certificate, etc., death certificate, was born here, was deported, was killed, died there, etc. So we have this for, and this is unique in Europe, nobody really has it. Yeah? All the different countries are having very big problems with this kind of project. France, where the, where the say the uh, amount of victims is about in the same category, uh, they had a, a wall in Paris with all the names, and if you go and look there, you will see that it was, there were so many mistakes, they had to take out names and uh, put in new ones, and, but the mistakes were so many that now they are taking down this 
wall of marble stones and are replacing it by something else. What is, from your point of view, uh, the, the problem or the main question that is uh, opened by Austrofascism? The problem with the period from 34 to 38 is that uh, you can't uh, develop the same kind of consensus, historical consensus, as for 38 to 45. 38 to 45 was the period where everybody in Austrian society from the, uh, call it uh, conservative side or the socialist, social democratic side, they were persecuted, they were put together, they were deported to Dachau, the, the political leaders, uh, other people were uh, put into concentration camps, they were killed, etc. After 45, this made it very easy to say, okay, uh, I think that the, the slogan was the solidarity of the camp street, the Solidarität der Lagerstraße. Yeah? We were in the same camps, uh, persecuted by the same people. Uh, let's start new. And this worked after 45. Yeah? For the period 34 to 38, there is no such a thing. Yeah? There is a clear historical evidence who destroyed democracy. Yeah? Who did that? Yeah? And that was the conservatives. Yeah? And this is, of course, nobody. W this, of course, nobody wants to hear today, especially not the representatives of the conservative party, yeah? or not very many of them. There are some who say, yes, it's true. It was a historical mistake. We did that when um, when Parliament dissolved itself, as it is said. Of course, this is a. Uh, uh, historical myth, it didn't uh, dissolve itself, of course, and then there was always the conservative president who could have solved this uh, whole situation with a very simple decision, yeah? but he didn't. Yeah? They actually quite liked this. Yeah? They most of the representatives of the, of the conservatives, or the, as they were called, the Christian socialists at the time, they were not so big Democrats. Yeah? They were in this parliament because they had to be, uh, but they were not very happy about this compromise, yeah? this democratic compromise, and they were quite happy to do away with it. Yeah? And this, I think, uh, many people in the, on the conservative side don't want to uh, confront, actually. Yeah? But uh, sooner or later it will be. And as you've seen maybe in the, in the exhibition of the House, of, uh, House der Geschichte, House of History, there is this, to my mind, uh, quite strange thing that, what is it now? Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, it, there were different terms that were discussed. Uh, presidential dictatorship, yes. uh, uh, Kanzler dictator. Where is the problem with, with fascism? Why is it uh, not fascism any longer? Uh, it, it was uh, dictatorship after the historical uh, Italian model, which of course was fascist, yeah? So I found this very strange. Uh, what I liked best about it is in this whole discussion, and uh, I think it's very revealing, yeah? That at the university in Graz, all of a sudden, a student group sta uh, started to prepare posters from leaders of the uh, then uh, austro fascist party uh, with the question, uh, bin ich jetzt kein Faschist mehr? Yeah? Am I no longer a fascist? Yeah? And they were all, all over the, uh, one of the universities in Graz, Fachhochschule Graz. Yeah? And I thought that this is a very funny way to deal with this discussion. Yeah? Uh, yeah. So that's, that's why I think that this is the, the really the contested question. And the exhibition there does not solve it at all. Yeah? Or it doesn't really it's a difficult question, and what, you, what to do with it in an e exhibition, yeah? The, uh, there is another exhibition in St. Pölten, as you probably know, about the same period. I don't think that their solution is, is, is a perfect solution, but at least by uh, sort of uh, presenting the different kinds of discussions or narratives that there are, they made it at least clear for the people who want to go into this question that it's an undecided thing. There is a contested, there are contested narratives we can't say at the moment, and this you can somehow visualize in an uh, exhibition. In, it's, it happened 
uh, a lot better, I think, in St. Pölten than it uh, happened here, but uh, then I'm very critical of this uh, exposition because I resigned from the board, uh, as, as you probably know. If you could uh, expose uh, some events or periods that uh, are coming out of a certain analysis of the right-wing movement in Austria, that uh, it's really important because it's showing a change or actually showing a certain cut in this history. Well, I think that uh, the, the Freedom Party and uh, the party that went before, so the VDU, uh, basically, that was uh, the camp of the former Nazis, that, that we can say. It was founded and it functioned in post-war politics as basically the camp of people who came from the Nazi party and uh, wanted to remain there. Yeah? So this, this is, so this is uh, the German nationalist camp also to a a certain extent because I think that what is interested, interesting in Austrian politics is that in the, uh, as, as a kind of heritage from the 19th century, the interwar period is uh, sort of uh, structured in a, in a very strange way. The big dividing line, the big political cleavage to my mind is not between conservatives, at, so left and right. Huh? It is actually between what I would call clerical and anti-clerical parties. Huh? Uh, and the on the clerical side you have basically one big party and that is the Christian conservatives. Huh? Uh, on, on the anti-clerical side, historically speaking, you have uh, the liberals, the German nationals uh, and the social democrats. Huh? And for a long time, I think actually till the time of Kreisky in the 60s, if you had political movement, it was among these parties, but this big dividing line was not really crossed very much. Yeah? There is a, a fraction of German nationalist Christian Democrats, uh, but I don't think that they are so strong. But basically this is how it works. Yeah? Now, and in, in post-war politics, then uh, I think you can see this that uh, you have very, very quickly when the, when the party is formed, it, it is a kind of Sammelbecken, so it, it's a kind of, uh, it, it, it collects around it all these people who were either German nationalists, Nazis, fascists, etc. And a very small, tiny segment, which is not, never very strong in Austria, classical liberals, like 19th century liberals, who were also anti-clerical. Yeah? They meet in the FPÖ and uh, the, the thing that we find is that a lot of workers who had voted for the Social Democrats before 1934, after the war, uh, uh, then go over actually to the Nazis. And after the war, yeah, many former Nazis join the Social Democratic Party. Yeah? And there is lots and lots of jokes about it. Yeah? The, the famous joke is for Carinthia, Canton, is that they say the Social Democratic Party in Carinthia is like a punch cake. Yeah? So there is a pink glazing and a brown mass inside. Yeah? Or uh, there, there was this stupid joke about the uh, BSA, Bund Sozialistische Akademiker. Yeah? And the joke was, uh, why is there a B before SA? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, because there were quite a lot of uh, people who had not, not unimportant roles in the Nazi party who later, 10 years later, emerged again in the Social Democratic Party. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I think, the, the, and this also makes it possible that then you have this coalition, Social Democratic Party and FPÖ for some time bef before Haider really puts an end to that. Uh, Haider is a kind of radicalization of the FPÖ. Yeah? So this is one big uh, uh, break in this history of, of uh, right-wing politics in Austria. There is a kind of radicalization. Haider is, uh, to my mind, uh, a person who very early on realizes that the way to power for his party is through populist politics and not through uh, right-wing German national 
romanticism, yeah? which basically ends up in the split that Haider initiates into Bezetter and the really hardcore German nationalists right wings remain in the FPÖ. And it is Strache who remains there. Yeah? Uh, and this is the kind of FPÖ that we have today. Yeah? Uh, one effect of this in right-wing politics is, and that's the big difference to Germany, in Germany I think, for example, we have lots and lots of uh, right-wing groups yeah, that are all over the, all over the so, so party spectrum. Yeah? And there is a lot of uh, political activism which is outside the parliament. Yeah, and outside the political system. You don't have that here in Austria. Yeah? Because we really have a party like the FPÖ that sort of captures all this uh, political uh, sphere and the politics. These people feel represented through FPÖ. Yeah? Um, what was a second sort of watershed, I think, is that we have uh, a bomb attack in 1995 on this Roma settlement in Burgenland yeah, with five people. So this is the r first real political murder in the Second Republic. Yeah? There are some others, but they do not concern Austrian politics. Yeah? So there is Nippel, and who is being killed by synthesizers of the Palestinian, of one of the Palestinian groups. Yeah? There is um, Kirchwega, uh, who, but he is not murdered, yes? He is struck down, he's an old man, he eats his head on a cobblestone and that's it, yeah? So you can't say this is murder. But here you have a bomb attack, yeah? You have a, a bomb that is planted, f four people dead. Uh, and the interesting thing is that for the first time here, uh, you have a big wave of solidarity from the government down and in the population with the victims of this right-wing yeah? uh, uh, violence. This was not so very clear before. Yeah? It's, not a st it's not a state ceremony, but everybody is there. Yeah? The, the president, nearly the whole gov uh, federal government, the, the provincial government, all the bishops are there. There's nearly 10,000 people who attend. Yeah? And, uh, that creates a new, completely new kind of feeling and also a very clear uh, sort of uh, expression of anti-fascist feeling and mood in the country. Yeah? So, and there you can see that when it comes to this question, so opinions start to divide. Yeah? And there, from the 19, middle 19, 90s onwards, the thing stays. Yeah? So I think uh, it changes again. Uh, to my mind, in the about 10, 15 years ago, when uh, the tactics basically change, I think, of uh, uh, FPÖ politics. Yeah? And the tactics now is that you do something which, or as well, the FPÖ does something uh, which undermines completely the, not political, but the moral consensus of the Second Republic. Yeah? which is, if I want to simplify it very much, is but basically this, this consensus of there is something like human rights. Yeah? Every person has a dignity, deserves some respect. And then from the 2000s onwards, we get this very clear message. There are some people we do not respect. And everything is allowed against these people. Yeah? And this is completely then undermining everyday life. Yeah? And then all of a sudden, all, a lot of hatred, a lot of, is, is entering into politics more and more. Yeah? Where in the 90s, already people were persecuted for a slogan like Ausländer Halt. Yeah? In the 2000s, this is completely normal. Yeah? This is an acceptable political position to have. Yeah? So this, there is a big, uh, watershed here, and I think, yeah, that, that, that's where we are today. Yeah, and speaking of the right-wing and uh, racist uh, discourses, uh, what is the nature of the correlation between uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Romanism and Islamophobia, uh, anti-migrant racism? Well, I, I would say that historically speaking, uh, there is 
in, Aus in Austrian society. From the 19th century onwards, you have two things. You have, first of all, a kind of uh, strong uh, and classical European anti-Semitism, yeah? which is uh, sort of expressed in this way that you don't get married to a so-called Jew, for example. Yeah? It is being frowned upon. Yeah? Uh, with the Roma, it is something different. Yeah? With the Roma, it is actually that there is, in the 19th century, a stereotype that evolves, that the Roma are people who, you know, they have uh, no homeland, they are just aimlessly wandering around, everybody sits in a wagon, etc. Yeah? Which is true for maybe 7 to 10 percent of the Roma population, but not for the rest. So, being Roma actually means in the 20th century to deny that one belongs to this group. Huh? Uh, and uh, it doesn't really play a role in public discourse huh? till the 19, late 1970s, early 80s. N nobody really thinks about it, whether there are some Roma or not. The area I come from, by chance, is the one where there always were quite a lot of Roma. And we all we always had so to so the so-called Zigeuner yeah? uh, in the in the local society, yeah? and of course there was quite clear this is uh, some something that you you don't I mean you, you can it's how to say these are things that you can find and and uh, this is a, a a kind of system moral system that you grow up with yeah and it's internalized yeah so think about it when what would happen if you go home and say i have this girlfriend and she is a gypsy yeah Ooh, yeah you know immediately there would be problems yeah but alone the the fact that you start to think about it yeah shows already that there is this so to say uh, 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 structural yeah uh, segregation in society and i think that was the position in, in, in the political life, this did not really play a role. But the classical FPÖ was, of course, uh, but they didn't dare to mention that. Yeah? So they did, they did very rarely did you find very clear anti-Semitic uh, remarks. Yeah? The interesting thing was that, that uh, the first massive recourse to anti-Semitic slogans happened during the Waldheim uh, affair. Yeah? So that was quite astonishing. Yeah? Uh, with, with the slogans, with the poster, Jetzt erst recht, which is a historical slogan from uh, actually uh, the period of Austro-Fascism and, uh, and the persecuted Nazis. Uh, the, the yellow poster, it, it's a yellow poster, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I had completely forgotten, I must say. Yeah? I, I, I saw the film of Ruth Beckerman about this thing again, and I was completely shocked, I have to confess, because I had forgotten how strongly anti-Semitic actually the discourse at the time, the political discourse in the campaign speeches was. Yeah? How clearly this was being articulated, sometimes uh, in some sort of uh, covered, covered terms, you know, the, the people from the East Coast, etc. But it was so clear to read. Yeah? And there, I think this is the first time that it comes back very strongly into Austrian politics. What is strange today is, and here I think the FPÖ has learned quite clearly that uh, with clearly anti-Semitic positions you can't win elections. Yeah? Because uh, also internationally, the, you, you get into a very uh, impossible position. And what has happened is, also, or, of course, also what makes it easier is that all, also in Israel, the political spectrum has shef shifted, and now you have uh, Netanyahu yeah, and his political party, and all of a sudden there is a political partner for the European right in Israel. Yeah? And this is super. Yeah? This is super because actually the, the argument of anti-Semitism was an argument that the left or the center-left could always use against the center-right or the right-wing parties. And now they team up with the Israeli uh, sort of uh, right and all of a sudden this, this uh, doesn't work anymore. Yeah? And now everybody can say, oh, no, no, we have nothing against the Jews, we all love the Jews, we support Israel, etc. And it works 
it works quite well and it is being used actually as a tool, as a hammer yeah, uh, to hit the Muslims at the moment. Yeah? And we have this uh, whole discourse about old and new anti-Semitism, meaning old is, you know, the, the, the fascist past, but we have overcome that. Yeah? Uh, apparently, or so we are made to believe that this is, doesn't happen anymore. Yeah? And, uh, and there is the new, and the new one is being brought in by the Muslims. Yeah? And I think that's, uh, that's just a, a covered uh, way of uh, uh, pushing racist politics. Yeah? It clearly is racist. Yeah? So there is a very strong bias against uh, people from the Middle East and uh, Muslims in general. Yeah? and uh, it has nothing to do with their real uh, sort of uh, religious affiliation to any of the branches of Islam. Yeah? But it, it is, before that it was to a very strong, uh, for, for a very long time, uh, it was the guest workers. Yeah, yeah, Gastarbeiter, yeah? yeah? and we didn't even make a differentiation, you know, it, it was just Jushin. Nobody cared if they were Turks or if they were uh, ex-Yugoslavs, yeah? Yugos and Turks as we used to call them, yeah? and especially nobody made a distinction between Bosnians and Serbs and Croats and it was just all one thing. Uh, this has all changed yeah? and now there is this very strong emphasis on anti-Muslim uh, sentiment and this is being used and having a discussion as we have it nowadays that a Muslim family wants to buy a piece of land in one of the communities, uh, this is quite shocking. Yeah. So you would say that uh, Islamophobic racism uh, is, a, uh, is an uh, iteration of uh, old uh, racisms, out of which uh, anti-Semitism came? I wouldn't have called it that. I think that it has metamorphosed into anti, yeah, it is xenophobia, yeah? and it was xenophobia, it just had a different face, so to speak, yeah? and from, from this old xenophobia, uh, which didn't prove so very successful in the political life, now there we have a new one, yeah? and now the face is Islam, basically. Yeah? and the refugee crisis, etc., yeah, but, but very strongly, so not only in Austria, of course, this is all over Europe, yeah? and then, and, and it, I think it gets then very, very dangerous when, when the then still uh, Vice-Chancellor Strache uh, uh, takes over concepts of like this exchange of populations from the really hardcore right-wing, yeah? like uh, Mr. Selner and the uh, and, and uh, the identitarian movement. Yeah? Uh, it's possible also to think about the colonial racial division, so that this uh, Islamophobia, this, uh, uh, so to say, the, the way how EU uh, practically uh, removed the refugees, uh, exported or stopped them in Africa, uh, stopped them uh, with the deal with Turkey, uh, we barely hear uh, some talks about the refugees at the present. We just, uh, if somebody, it's uh, some big thing, but it's almost everybody beha behaving, this uh, is not anymore a problem. It's connected actually also with this racialization, racism, structure, but also a connection with the colonial past. I think that basically in the political debate, the knowledge that we had in the 70s, that the first world is related to the third world, as it was called in the 70s and 80s, this has completely disappeared. Yeah? In the 70s and 80s, we had also, through different kinds of players, and not party politics so much. Yeah? Some party politics, but basically, no, it was mainly church and uh, civil uh, society organizations. But we all grew up with this understanding that the poverty there has to do something with us. Yeah? And this knowledge has completely disappeared. Yeah? 
this has been completely cut away. This has been uh, pushed under the table. Yeah? That's why I think it doesn't uh, figure anymore. Yeah? Yes. Our research is to rethink the genocidal politics of Belgium, that means the colonial past, the Congo, that was very specific as a model, then anti-Semitism, and we take Austria, I mean the Second World War, Holocaust, what happened in Europe, and also this turbo fascism, this specific, uh, very invigorated nationalism in ex Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. As three territories and then the phenomena. This is why I'm asking uh, if it's possible um, in uh, rethinking, for example, the status of Europe today, uh, what's going on with the refugees, uh, uh, also connect precisely back to the colonial past. Uh, it does. To my mind, it does. Uh, I'm just not so sure that it, it really figures in the political discourse. Uh, uh, to, my, to my mind, I think, if we take this longer perspective, yeah, if you look at the history of camps, uh, but this is, this is a colonial practice, yes? So before the 1880s, you had no camps in Europe, not, not whatsoever, yeah? It's not, I'm not talking about prisoner camps, you know, but this idea that you go on holiday, you send your children to a camp on holiday, yeah? All this does not exist, yeah? And, uh, and uh, uh, prisoners of war camps or refugee camps or whatever, it's just not there. But this is a colonial practice that is very quickly around the turn of the century, so 19th before the First World War, it is re-imported into European life. And all of a sudden you have a phenomenon which uh, two French historians have then called the century of camps. And then the camps are everywhere because you have so many relocations of peoples, people. Yeah? Uh, during the First World War, it's not only the prisoners of war. Yeah? It is only that uh, when the front moves, lots of populations are being taken uh, from one region because you can't really trust them, you don't know because it's the same language, language is spoken across the border, so you take them and relocate them and it is very, very, very ugly how uh, the army and the political representatives uh, treat the local population in the non-German speaking areas of the Habsburg monarchy. Yeah? So if you uh, read the book of Rauchensteiner, yeah? who is a conservative historian, but a very good historian. Yeah? And he, he wrote a fantastic documentation about Austria in the First World War and about the debates that were going on and the political leadership was already in discussion with the military leadership and said, how will we ever re-establish something like a normal country if you treat the local populations like this? Everybody will hate us after the war. Yeah? You can't do this, and this is really a kind of nearly genocidal policy that is going on. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you, if you, when you mention, say, the Balkans, yes, yeah, so, so there is places like Doboy, yeah, which is uh, horror, and it is a precursor of what will happen then yeah, in the Nazi period. And I think it's important to know. To my mind, there is no Holocaust without the First World War, yeah? because how to, be, you know, the, the, the software and the hardware for establishing camps, that is already there, that is established in the First World War. Yeah? And 18, it's, it's not such a big distance, 18 to 20 years later we start again. The people are still there who did it once, they knew how to do this, and they knew that it doesn't work, of course. Yeah? You have, uh, in Graz we have this famous uh, case of, uh, they take people, uh, 5,000 people from the Russian front, yeah? Uh, Rusinen, yeah? uh, put them in a camp where now the, where now the airport is of Graz, yeah? um, when, and these, these are civilians. Yeah? Uh, when they protest, I think they hang three or four of them, you know, the, the, the priest and, and some speakers, and then typhoid fever breaks out, and they, they, they just close the doors and more or less five, not all 5,000 perish, but the majority of them, they die there. Yeah? So it's not so different of what is then going on in the camps in the Second World War. Yeah? So this is, and all this is actually re-imported from the colonial uh, sphere back into European life. Yeah? And I think that uh, the same is happening now, so that when, when uh, 
society is falling apart, especially in Africa. Yeah? So I must say that I've given up following African politics because I can't keep track anymore. Yeah? To, to my mind, sub-Saharan Africa is dissolving into a kind of uh, chaos that is very difficult to judge. Yeah? and to see and who are the players, oh God, I mean, you would have to spend your whole life yeah, with this one question. It used to be a much more stable uh, region. I was, I was, I think, 21 when some friends of mine suggested that we take a trip in a, in a little bus yeah, all around the Sahara, one year, yeah, and uh, go down Morocco and quite across and come back through, through Sudan and Egypt wonderful trip i didn't go yeah uh, and i regret it because nowadays this would be completely impossible but then it was possible it was a stable more or less stable societies yeah and now this world is completely disintegrating and that people don't want to see yeah, that the refugee crisis that we have from africa has exactly with to do with the thing what we and our economies are producing in africa yeah? uh, that is a tragedy because we will sooner or later have to wake up be, to this question, why will people risk drowning in the Mediterranean? Yeah? It, why is this risk better than anything else? Yeah? What must the situation be like that when you say, okay, we know that 20% drown, so I have a one to five chance to not make it, but I still take it. Yeah? The situation has to be very bad. Yeah? And when it comes to the Middle East, of course, you have the same thing. The Middle East was always sort of cut up and structured right from the beginning. Yeah? Where is the oil? Where are the pipelines? This is what we do. Yeah? There is a, an in interesting uh, historian at uh, Cambridge who calls himself Franco Pan, although he has historically nothing to do with, uh, with the family. Uh, his father only claimed that he was of uh, Croatian royal blood. Yeah? Uh, and he wrote rather a good book about about uh, the Middle East and Central Asia called uh, the Silk Road, yeah? where he describes exactly what happens there yeah? and says this is one of the big turning points of uh, 19th, 20th century, mainly 20th century, yeah? and uh, establishing of the big global oil firms yeah? that does that does it then for for these regions, and uh, Europe doesn't want to see that. Yeah? If we wanted to do something about the crisis yeah, in Syria, there is no reason in the 20th century why people have to walk 2,000 kilometers. Yeah? One of the political uh, aides of uh, uh, Merkel actually during the crisis said, this is complete madness. If we want to help these people, we fly uh, from Antalya. Yeah? We, we organize the flights in Antalya and we have the chance to look through, you know, who are these people who come, who is a political refugee, etc., and not let them walk through the Balkans yeah, for thousands of kilometers. But that was what the political elites wanted, actually, and they have created a new problem out of this. Because when you're sitting in Kosovo and you've just been deported from, re deported from Germany and sitting in the Kosovo and you see all these people and you get a second chance to get to Western Europe, you probably take it. And I would take it, I have to confess. Yeah? I would take it as well. And I think there is, there is a, the big change is actually in the attitude towards refugees. Yeah? Because when we grew up, and this is, so to speak, one of the positive side effects of the Cold War, yeah, the refugee, that was a hero. Yeah? And if you read Austrian yearbooks yeah, of the Ministry of the Interior, uh, Austria was the uh, home of refugees par excellence. Yeah? When, we, when the Hungarians came in '56, we became world famous. Yeah? We take in the refugees. And even afterwards, the, the reports are so funny to read because there's a success report. We succeeded to take in 1,200 refugees this year from Chile, from here, from there. Yeah? Completely strange nowadays. Yeah? Not that the people were well treated, you have to say that, because uh, there was a lot of xenophobia even after the Second World War, yeah, uh, against these people. Bec and also they were living in camps. This is, we have completely forgotten, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so I find it very strange that this, uh, this aspect is sort of cut out. You know, after 1945, we have a, a population of six million and we have 
1.2 million refugees in the country, now that is a crisis. Yeah? That is really, you have 20% uh, refugee population, and they are all in the West because they wanted, of course, to go to the uh, American zone and not the, the Soviet zone. Yeah? There is, I, I don't know now by, by heart, yeah? but there is maybe 40 to 50 very large refugee camps all over the place. Yeah? Salzburg. Salzburg was a town with 50,000 before the war. After the war, you have uh, 30,000 refugees around, and the, uh, on the other side, 30,000 GIs. Sociologically, not a stone remains unturned in a city like this. Yeah? And when you read the, the history of the city of Salzburg, ooh, nothing. It's, it's all only sound of music, more or less. Yeah? So this, this is something that we don't want to confront. The same with Wales, etc. Uh, this has been completely erased. Yeah? For us, immigration starts in 1964 with the signing of the first treaty with Turkey about some thousand guest workers who don't come then for another four or five years. Yeah? This is not true, so there is, there is a lot of, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, completely irrational thinking about this question. Yeah? So the mid-90s, the thing with refugees was about integration get them integrated into society, get them settled, say, this is over. Nobody wants to integrate anybody anymore. Yeah? Lock them up, wait till you get, can send them back. Yeah? And this is asking for trouble. Yeah? This is completely stupid, yeah? naive, uh, and creates so many problems that we didn't need to have. Uh, you don't let uh, thousands of people work. Yeah? What, is, what, what is the only legitimate work for somebody who is working to, to get his uh, refugee st status clarified. How can, you, can he make money in Austria, do you know? Prostitution, huh? then nothing else. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's not illegal, I don't need a work permit, that's it. Yeah? All the rest is impossible. Why are you actually uh, uh, withdraw from the house of history? Uh, what, what were the reasons, uh, conceptual uh, or uh, others, that you actually that you don't want anyone to, to work with them? Uh, this is a diff difficult question. Yeah? It was in the beginning not called the House of History, or the, the term was there, but the idea actually was to have an exhibition about 100 years of Austrian Republic. Yeah? Uh, and that was an idea I liked very much. Um, my problem was actually not so much with uh, uh, historiographical positions. Yeah? Uh, there were quite a few which I did not agree with. Yeah? But I think that the, the problem was here that it uh, is one of those typical Austrian uh, projects that uh, uh, crumble. Yeah? First, we have this big idea that we will make it into big and with the republic it needs and, and um, an exhibition and, and uh, a museum and a house and an institution. And then, it, yes, we give 10 million and then, then we give less and then it is shrunk and there's not an own building and we put it in the, into the old, uh, uh, in the wing of one of the, the Hofburg uh, and it, it sort of gets smaller and smaller and smaller and this was, I think, the, the main problem there. Now, I happen to know quite a number of people who've been working there as historians, like Georg Hoffmann or um, also Stefan Benedict, for example, yeah, with wh whom I've known for many, many years and I value him greatly. But I think the problem was that here a very small group of people were charged with producing an exhibition uh, in a very short time. Yeah? over topics which are political minefields. Yeah? And this is something which is very difficult and I have been sort of uh, asking for more people to be there, uh, all, all the resources being put into the exhibition actually to create a very good exhibition that was actually my idea so that you have a very good argument to keep this institution. Yeah? Uh, and uh, because it was clear that it, uh, the, the government would change probably, yeah? um, and this did not come. Yeah? So there was, for a very long time, it was 
unclear what the story would be. Huh? And I think this is the major problem, that there is no connecting story. Huh? And this uh, you can see in many, many different parts. So uh, when I walk through the exhibition, I see many interesting things, but I also see many things which I don't know why they are there. Not, not that they are misrepresented, it's just the selection and the combination of things. Why are they there? Huh? So what is the how what kind of weight do you give to different things? Yeah? And some I don't understand. And then I I had this impression that would but well, I, I we had a lot of discussions yeah? uh, also about different texts uh, because when uh, you have to write texts about things that you don't know really well, of course, and you and you have to write uh, uh, I don't know yeah seven lines about a complex thing. One line you get wrong, you get it very wrong. Yeah. And then we had these discussions when I said this is not right here and not right there and should we have more about the border question, how do you want to pre present the border question, yeah? Um, uh, is it important? Now I could say yes, the question of uh, 34 to 38, yeah? I would not have done it like that. I have this impression that there are central things which are missing in this story, yeah? For example, 34 to 38. This is critical, but it's not the only one. I give you another one. Süd Tirol, yeah? Southern Tirol. Where is it in this exhibition? You know, this, this to my mind is for Austrian history, this topic, yeah? and also the relation of Austrians to Süd Tirol, yeah? is so central for the 20th century. Yeah? And it's nowhere. Yeah? In the exhibition there is a little bit about the Brenner and there is a poster and something. Yeah? But what it means, uh, you have the, this, uh, the, the big popula uh, Southern Tyrolean population that in 39 is being brought here, the people that go back, uh, we treat them actually over decades, we treat them as co-nationals, although they don't have citizenship. Yeah? Uh, every uh, student from Southern Tyrol automatically gets a grant at an Austrian university. For many, many decades it was so. Well, what is the basis of this? The basis of that they are Austrians, you know, yeah? They belong to us, yeah? And they were taken away, yeah, after the First World War, and this was an unjust thing, and they are being persecuted. Yeah? I find it, I, f I agree, I, the border as it was drawn was not just in any way, yeah? It was a political border. Yeah? And uh, the Austrian identity of the South Tyrolians, to my mind, is quite funny. Yeah? Because when you, when you ask somebody in, in Munich, or they say we are Germans. Then you go to Tyrol, they say we are in Österreich. In, in uh, Süd Tyrol, they say we are some Deutsche. Yeah? Very few people say that they are Austrians. So in their identity, they are German Tyrolians, but I think the German element is a lot stronger than this. There is a strong tie to Tyrol. Yeah? That is the problem of Austria anyway, that we have very strong regional identity and a rather weak, so, so to speak, national identity. Yeah? That, that is a characteristic. They are Tyrolians first and foremost. Whether they are Austrians, this is a quite different question. Yeah? And this, but you, you have a phenomenon like this. Nearly every big town has a Südtiroler Platz, a Südtiroler Siedlung, a Südtiroler Straße. We have the FP campaigning for giving citizenship from people from Südtirol on what uh, hereditary G DNA grounds, whatever, yeah? And this does not figure in an ex exhibition like that. I don't understand it, yeah? I think there is something missing and there were um, some other things that happened in, in the exhibition, yeah? Uh, there is the, the horse, yeah, from the Waldheim debate. That is, that is fine, yeah? But who knows what this is? I do. Yeah? Uh, I went through the exhibition with a, a historian, actually. Yeah? So contemporary historian from Berlin. The woman is, I think, 36, 37 years old. She had no idea. And it is not really explained. So there is many assumptions that were being made. Uh, I think that uh, the, the whole question of post-war history yeah? and the debate of how we deal with the Nazi past is overrepresented. Yeah? 
I can understand why this is. Yeah? But unfortunately, where is the second half of the hundred years? Where are the 60s, where are the 70s, where are the 80s, 90s? Yeah? There are some stuff, but there is no story being told about what happened in this country. Yeah? There is no narrative after uh, the, the failed attempt to deal with the Nazi past. This is the big post-war narrative in the uh, exhibition, but after that, ooh. Yeah? And I think that there are some very uh, crucial moments. For example, the 60s and Kreisky, yeah? where Kreisky manages, as I said, there is this cleavage between uh, uh, clerical and anti-clerical uh, two big camps, and Kreisky manages to break this up. Yeah? Where he, his slogan is, you know, you don't have to join us as social democrats, you only have to vo uh, vote for us. Yeah? Ein Stück des Weges mit uns gehen. Yeah? We will modernize the country. Yeah? And that, that is, uh, how, how do you say, that's an earthquake in Austrian politics. Yeah? And that has basically from the 60s to the early 90s determined for over 20 years what was going on in this country. Yeah? That many people who came from Christian social backgrounds, rather conservative, they still voted yeah, for the social democrats and for modernization. Yeah? So there is many of these things that I don't see and I thought that they should have been there. So this, uh, at a certain point I thought this is not something that I need to see my name yeah, on, the, on the poster. So. How do you see the future of uh, conviviality in Austria? Is it possible and what would be the main uh, preconditions? Well, when I try to answer this, you have to know, I come from a minority organization. I don't know if you know this. So I come from southern Burgenland. I was born in a half Hungarian family. I've been a member of the Hungarian minority organizations since I was, I think, 15. I am, uh, uh, what is it called, president of the Vienna Hungarian School Association for 25 years. Yeah? So this question of uh, multilingualism, yeah? multicultural, th that is some that has been in my life. I've, I've, I've produced uh, Hungarian minority TV in Austria for over 20 years. Yeah? So, uh, and there I see a, a a very big and dangerous change. Yeah? With this background uh, from minority activists, I don't know, uh, when I hear then these uh, strange ideas, you know, forbidding to speak uh, foreign language in school, of course not every foreign language, only certain foreign languages, because uh, uh, it's so ridiculous, you know. Yeah? But you can see that the atmosphere is changing. Yeah? And this is, I think, what is very dangerous. Yeah? And this is, this is getting worse, um, uh, not, not everywhere. So uh, in the province I come from, in Burgenland actually, the, the funny thing is that this language question has, be, has become completely depoliticized. Yeah? Uh, there is a positive effect actually and that's what I'm uh, hoping for when, when we ask this. So I can see in, in the Austrian politics this, this very xenophobic streaks. Yeah? But I think that uh, European politics very strongly affects what is happening and not happening. Yeah? So the uh, politics of the European Union in, in this level is actually very actively promoting yeah? exactly this kind of, uh, also the protection of minority languages, yeah, and multilingual, uh, uh, what, what is it called, uh, multilingualism, yeah. So, and, and maybe the situation of the province of Burgenland is interesting because there always was, since the 1930s, a question of the use of different languages, Hungarian, because in 21 it was the language of the, you know, the, the, the state that the province was taken away from, yeah? So everybody who spoke Hungarian was actually a proto-Hungarian, yeah? And a Hungarian irredentist fighter or something. At the same time, then it became the Croatian language after the war, because most of the Croatian organizations were very strongly conservative and the social democratic uh, government of the province saw the Croatians as a kind of proto-organizing uh, uh, camp for, for, for the ÖVP, yeah? 
this is all completely disappeared. You know, in the 70s, we used, we used to discuss about bilingual road signs. Yeah? Now everybody is happy and the change came with the European Union. This kind of influence of the European Union with gives me hope that Austria will not completely sink into a kind of German nationalist uh, idiocy. Yeah?